Hey folks, so in this video, I'm going to do a recap on all of the events that happened earlier this week. I'm also going to talk about future events. We're going to see this upcoming week, and I'm going to end us off with some technicals. So on Friday, we essentially got the non-farm payroll data. And um, let me just show you real quick. So if we're looking at the uh, total non-farm payroll jobs, you know, this is in thousands. So in August, we saw 315,000 jobs. And in September, we saw 263,000 jobs. Now, these are preliminary numbers, but this is coming in lower than in August. So this is a good thing. But here is the kicker. When I scroll down a little bit and I show you guys the average hourly earnings, you know, this number is going up. So we went from $32.36 to $32.46. So not a good thing. And um, earlier this week, we also had JOLTS data. So this is the job openings. So this number came in a little bit lower than um, the prior reading. So we got about 10 million job openings here. And um, in the prior reading, you know, we had about 11.23 million job openings. So um, this is a good thing, but if we're just looking back in 2019, you know, we're essentially seeing uh, job openings that were around 7 million. So we are still very, very high. And this is a bad thing because if we have too many job openings, that means that employers, you know, they all have to fight for the same employees. So essentially, they have to pay more to employees, which is basically causing us uh, wage inflation. So not a good thing right here. So um, another thing that we saw was the OPEC plus announcement. So this was very, very bad for the Biden administration. OPEC plus basically announced a 2 million barrel production cut. That represents about 2% of global production. So um, definitely not a good thing. If we're looking at the West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil, um, we're basically seeing a massive rally in crude oil. So we are definitely likely to see um, prices of gasoline go up in the future. Um, just a quick recap on this, you know, right here at the end of September, you know, this was about $78, 79 uh, it's all the way up at about 91 right now. So pretty big rally here. Now, here's another big um, issue of concern. If we're looking at the strategic petroleum reserves um, over at the EIA website, then um, I could essentially grab all of this information and create a graph. So um, here's what I'm going to do for you. Made this nice little graph, and you guys can see that um, our... Strategic reserves are down to 1980 levels. So if we're looking all the way back here, you know, this was about 1985-ish, or let's see, that's right there, 1984. So we're back to 1984 levels. So this is a little bit concerning, you know. At some point, we're definitely going to have to refill these reserves because right now, you know, we're all the way back to 1980 levels. So just saying. Now, um, here's another thing that's concerning. So if we're looking at the average regular gasoline price in the United States, this is nationwide, uh, we can see this trend where um, in August, you know, it was going down. And then in September, it was going down again. But look here, at the end of September, we saw this uh, shift. So we went from $3.65 to $3.71, and then in October, $3.78. So um, this is a little bit concerning because we're going to have to watch out for that headline CPI number. And um, I definitely think this is going to be a little bit more concerning for the next, next report. So not this upcoming report. Now, um, come Monday, uh, we're going to have Columbus Day. So corporate bond and treasury markets are going to be closed. On Tuesday, uh, we're going to have the start of this IMF World Bank Group annual meeting. And they're essentially going to talk about inclusive growth, food and energy crisis, education, climate, and developing needs. So this is going to go on from the 11th to the 13th. So if you guys are interested in just kind of understanding 
what the problems are and how they're going to tackle it, then you know this is a nice little um, thing to watch. And I'll go ahead and leave the link down below so you guys can watch this on YouTube when they do air it. So you guys can see, you know, this is actually going from the 10th to the 16th. So um, it's a six day event. Now, if we're looking at um, the big data that's going to drop, that is going to be on Thursday. So on Thursday, we're going to get um, CPI. And if we're looking at the core CPI month over month, you know, we're forecasted at 0.5%. So that's a little bit lower than the um, previous for August. So hopefully, you know, we don't come in higher because that would be very, very bearish for the markets. Also, the day prior, you know, on Wednesday, we're going to get Fed meetings or Fed minutes, excuse me, for the September um, meeting. Now, we're also going to get the producer price index, and that's also going to be on Wednesday. And we're going to get the EIA short term energy outlook. So when we do get that EIA short term energy outlook, I'll definitely let you guys know. Um, just kind of what their outlook is for future uh, gasoline prices. Now, um, if we're looking at some other data here, uh, on Friday, we're going to get U.S. core retail sales. Now, retail sales data is basically measuring spending at stores, online, and in restaurants. So we do want this uh, number to come in a little bit weaker because that would represent um, a slowing down economy. So that would be good for the Fed. So here we're forecasted at negative 0.1%. So this is still a little bit higher than the August reading. So, you know, not necessarily a good thing. Now, uh, let's see, last thing I want to talk about news wise, um, you know, there are a lot of earnings going on next Friday. So that is Friday the 14th. So um, we're going to see some earnings from JP Morgan. Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, Wells Fargo. Uh, so basically a lot of bank earnings. So we could see some big, big fluctuations on SPY because SPY has a lot of financials within it. Now uh, let's just go ahead and jump into the technicals. So I did something a little bit different. Now if you watched my last video, I talk a lot about demand zones. So over here, you know, I started labeling all these different demand and supply zones. So if we're looking at Apple right now, uh, right now we are in a former demand zone, but this could, if we start breaking underneath this, this could turn into a supply zone. So I have this marked in yellow because we don't really know what this is right now. We could easily break underneath this level and then this will become a future supply zone. So a supply zone is essentially where people sell into and then we see a lot of consolidation and then we see a leg down. Demand zone is where people buy into. So you can see right here, you know, they were buying the dip and then we saw this massive, massive rally. You can see uh, right here, they were selling the rip and then we saw these massive falls. Now this right here, you know, this was a former demand zone, but then you can see that we sold off and then it became a supply zone. So uh, one thing that I also want to know is that we do have this trend line right here. And uh, this goes back several years. So that is essentially where we are right now. So if we do see a cut below this, it could pretty much cause a big downfall to possibly the bottom of this uh, demand zone. And that uh, bottom is right around 127-ish. Um, and then we do have another demand zone over here. The bottom of this demand zone is right around um, 118. And then we have this uh, demand zone all the way down here. And then we have uh, this gap that has never been filled. Now this gap is pretty much um, ending right at 92.50. So, you know, there is a lot of downside if we do want to fill that gap. So that is something that is a little bit concerning right there. But there is a decent amount of um, demand in these areas right here. So, um, you know, obviously you don't want to be shorting too much if we get closer to that 127 level. That is likely an area where you may want to take a little bit of risk, you know, maybe buy a little bit, buy some calls, do something. But you don't want to be shorting in this area. So, um, 
definitely watch out for this trend line break. Um, if we are going to break this trend line, I would think it's maybe on like uh, bad CPI data or poor earnings. Um, I get a feeling that we're not just going to cut right down below this and then we're just going to end the week um, red if it's not without a big event. So that's Apple for you. Uh, let's take a look at SPY. So SPY, I have this area marked in yellow because, you know, this was a former um, demand zone. Or I guess it, I should say that it still is a demand zone based off of um, these, this buying right here. Also, you can see um, this buying right here as well before we had this massive rip. So right now, you know, this could turn into a supply zone if we start breaking underneath. Now, one of the things that did concern me a little bit is that we have this trend line. It goes all the way down to the pandemic lows. So if I draw this trend line out, you know, it's hitting this um, area of support that we bounced off of. And then right after we cut down below this trend line, you know, we had this massive sell off, dead cat bounce, and then we rejected this trend line. So to me, that just looks very, very bearish. So, you know, I don't really know what is going to happen. You know, are we going to hit the bottom of this demand zone right here? And that's going to be right around, let's see, that's right around um, 355. You know, are we going to hit the bottom of this demand zone and double, double bottom and rip? And then, you know, what's going to happen if we hit this trend line again? Are we just going to reject again or are we going to break out of it? So this trend line, in my opinion, is very, very important. Ideally, you know, if we're bullish, we want to get above it. If we're bearish, you know, we do want to see a retest and then another rejection. That would be pretty darn bearish because at that point, it will look something like a double top. And then we will be probably going into a serious amount of selling where we're going to enter this supply zone again. And then, you know, we could enter another... Uh, demand zone right here. So this was a former supply zone, but it could become a future demand zone. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, edit this, make it green. So essentially this entire area could potentially be a um, demand zone. But, you know, if you are going to get into this demand zone, obviously this second half would be a better area to position yourself in. So um, let me just go ahead change this back to red so you guys can visualize it a little bit more clear. So um, this area right here, this will be a pretty nice area to get yourself in. So that's right around um, 319. Now, I personally would be buying shares right around this level if we get down to it. I would definitely be buying shares. I may even be buying calls. So, um, you know, not financial advice. This is just what I plan on doing. So this will definitely be a nice area to um, be buying off of. Now, um, let's go ahead, look at the Qs. So the Qs also a little bit concerning to me. You know, we have a similar trend line. This is going all the way back to um, this area right here in 2018. So um, 2018, 2019, 2020, it goes through this area. Let me just zoom in for you guys so you guys can see what's actually going on here. You can see we're having these touches off this trend line. And then touch right here, massive gap up. So that's just kind of to show um, the importance of that trend line. You also see this bounce right here. Uh, you see this break right here, but then we go back and we retest it. We go back, we retest it again, and then we see this gap when we broke underneath it. So to me, you know, this is definitely a little bit more bearish. We also have this uh, downtrend channel that we're in right now. So um, we're currently in a demand zone, you guys. So when we entered this supply zone, you know, we sold off again, had this massive sell off. Right here, this is a demand zone. If you see right here, you know, there's a lot of buying here. And then we saw this massive rally. Buying over here again, massive rally. So um, the bottom of this demand zone here is at 260.52. I do believe that would be a decent area of entry. And if it does coincide with um, a drop down to this bottom trend line, I think that would be a nice setup. Now, again, not financial advice, just saying, um, 
just saying that you know that might be a good area to buy or I personally would probably be buying a call here now there is another demand zone right here uh, the bottom of that is at 251.55 and you know if we do get the bottom of this trend line as well you know that would be a good area to maybe get in in some calls so um, that's QQQ now let's take a look at Google so Google to me is very very interesting and um, I'll kind of show you why here so um, we have this gap right here and we went and filled that gap slightly cut underneath now um, if I draw this trend line down here to the pandemic lows you know we are having this little bounce right here and then now we're selling off again and it looks like we're going to approach this um, gap area right here again so you know ideally you know if we are looking for a bullish setup you know I think a good area to get in would probably be the bottom of this demand zone that would be right around uh, 9018 now you know if we do break through this trend line um, I would I wouldn't be surprised if we go down to the bottom of this demand zone and then we go back and we retest it so I do believe this would be a decent area of entry now there also is another demand zone um, right here and the bottom of that is around 84.72 so that would also be a nice area of entry and um, it would be coincide with this gap right here so there is a possibility that we could go down a little bit lower to fill that gap let me just zoom in on this right here so you guys can see it so this is the gap that I'm talking about so if we were to fully fill this gap that would be $83 on Google now here's where we're currently at um, you know this was a former demand zone but I have it marked in yellow because it's a little bit too soon to call it a supply zone so if we do get back in here and we sell off again then yeah I will go ahead change this color make it red and then I'll call it a supply zone because you know people are selling into it so right here you know people are buying into it massive rally right here people are selling into it so a demand zone can become a supply zone a supply zone can become a demand zone let's take a look at Microsoft so Microsoft right now you know we had this uh, supply zone that we sold off into we have this massive gap down now we are in this uh, demand zone so let me go ahead let me just zoom in a little bit so you guys can see what we're really working with so the bottom of this uh, demand zone right here is right around uh, 226.31 so that may not be a bad area of entry now you guys can see that we have these former resistances right here right there and right there so you know that would be um, working off a nice support now if I zoom out a little bit you know here is something concerning we do have this trend line and then you can kind of see it's catching these lows catches this um, pivot area catches uh, these lows as well you can see when we broke underneath it we had a pretty strong sell-off we rebounded and we rejected so to me that's pretty darn bearish and um, I almost feel like we could get um, down to this um, lower demand zone right here but you know a lot of that is going to depend on CPI data next week that will likely dominate um, the narratives in the market so let's take a look at XLF XLF we're likely going to see a lot of chop and that's because you know we have bank earnings coming up I showed you guys on Friday you know we have um, we have Morgan Stanley we have JP Morgan we have Wells Fargo so the financial sector is probably going to get rocked quite a bit so right now you know we're in this demand zone but we don't really know if this is a supply zone yet so if we start cracking underneath this uh, lower level which is let's see it's thirty dollars and thirteen cents if we start cracking underneath that then yeah we'll know that this was a supply zone and people are selling into it now so um, the next demand zone is likely going to come in to this area right here and the bottom of that um, demand zone will be right around 2788 so that would be a nice area to load up for a potential rally 
So um, that's XLF for you. Now here's Tesla. So um, you know Tesla, it's been having a pretty rough uh, few weeks. So um, we got that news with uh, Twitter. You know Elon's uh, basically going to buy Twitter at like um, what was it like fifty four dollars or something, and um, we had the delivery numbers come in a uh, week. So um, here's the big thing that I see on Tesla. So with Tesla, I see this uh, trend line right here. So you guys can see, you know, it was resistance, 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 and then huge bounce off of it. Support, support, support. And then now you can see we cracked underneath this. So now this trend line is going to be resistance. So right here, we have this pretty big demand zone. So you can see um, people are buying here, massive rally. People are selling into this supply zone, uh, selling into this supply zone as well buying again um, there's another supply um, demand zone right here so people are buying into all of these demand zones selling in these supply zones buying again here and then selling again here huge huge supply zone right here people were selling into and then you can see people were selling into this supply zone again and then now we're right back to this demand zone so the bottom of this demand zone is right around 205.72 and the next demand zone, the bottom of that, would be 181.48. Now, if we start cracking below that, um, we do have the support at 166.30. If we break below that, yeah, Tesla's kind of screwed. And um, the next demand zone after that would be 107.98. Now, at that point in time, you know, I actually think the valuations will be pretty darn good. So um, yeah, I would definitely be buying Tesla at these levels if we ever get down to it. Uh, I have my doubts, but um, I mean, I guess we'll see. And that basically concludes all the TA and um, all the news. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Have a great one.